Welcome back to the Weird Sisters Podcast, your source for Discworld discussion. My name is Ninam, and if your dear heart is wounded, my wild heart bleeds with yours. Joining me is Zill. Some motherfuckers always trying to ice skate uphill. Our book this month is Carpe Jugulum, the novel that somehow manages to mock multiple stories written years later. <laughs> So this is one that I've, like, every time I need to look up what the next book is so I can remember to go check it out from the library, I've always seen Carpe Jugulum pop up in the list and been like, what What kind of name is that? Like, what could that possibly mean? And then I got it, I flipped it around, and the first word that stuck out was the word vampire, and I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. <laughs> I mean, vampire is definitely a, a word that sticks out. <laughs> uh-huh. And I was just like I had no idea beforehand like what this one could possibly be about just based on the title and then I saw it and I was like okay I get I get the vibe that this one's going for yeah we got a lot to cover so let's skip the interview and get right to the trivia section published November 5th 1998 and coming at 84,000 words Carpe Jugulum is the 23rd Discworld novel and sixth in the Witches series its title is a dog Latin translation of Seize the Neck Although the actual Latin term for neck is column, the story references multiple versions of songs centered on magpies and how seeing them in different groups can foretell different events. The village of escrow is named after a contractual arrangement wherein money that will be transferred between two parties is given to an intermediary until agreed upon conditions are met. And most of the positive thinking platitudes in the dialogue are direct quotes, most notably, every day and every way we get better and better which is attributed to the French psychotherapist Emile Coux. Carpe Jugulum has been translated into 15 languages, and the unabridged audiobook, read by Nigel Planer, lasts 9 hours and 45 minutes, with an abridged version by Tony Robinson. Stephen Briggs published a stage adaptation in 1999, and that version was performed by Ook Productions in 2017. The book won the 2000 Lord Ruthven Award, which is an accolade presented by a collective of academic scholars who specialize in vampire fiction. I kind of want to sit in on one of their meetings. Right? Because it's either fascinating or super dull. Yeah, I can imagine it going either way. Maybe sometimes in the same meeting. Our story begins in Lanker, a rural kingdom home to four witches. One of them. Nanny Og, matriarch to an extended family that encompasses most of Lanker's population. Agnes Knit the newest member of the coven, whose self-loathing has coalesced into a second personality named Perdicia. The two of them are going to the naming ceremony for the daughter of the king and queen, the queen being the third witch, Magrat, who used to be full-time but has decided to focus more on her family. Kind of fun seeing Magrat again, because yeah. for those who missed out, uh, she's been a little bit absent since it seemed like the Witches series was sort of pivoting away from her, but now she's been brought back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really nice to get to spend some time with her, especially because it seems like she's grown a lot off screen. Her thing in this story is that she is very much a first-time mother and very nervous and always over-preparing, which mm -hmm. is definitely in keeping with her character. <laughs> Yeah, but at the same time, she still feels like she's really gained confidence in her position as a witch. Mm. Despite the fact that I don't know if she does much witching in this book. The witches never really do that much witching. That's kind of their mm -hmm. whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I would say witching. They do a lot of witching. They don't do a lot of magic. Yeah, I think that's a better way of putting it. Varence, Magret's husband and king of Lanker, he's a very forward-thinking and progressive individual, but his idealism tends to stumble up against reality. And in this case, he's invited all the nobility from the surrounding lands, which includes Count Magpire from the country of Überwald. We see the Count and his family traveling along the road to Lanker, where they are stopped by a highwayman and leave him with neither their money nor his blood. When we're introduced to the Magpire family, they're meant to be sort of a nuclear family parody. Mm -hmm. There's the dad and the uh, the kind of character underdeveloped mom, the Countess. Yeah, yeah, she very much like kind of disappears into the background for most of the book, it seems. 
Yeah, they have two kids, Vlad and Lacrimosa. Of the four of those, I think it's the two guys that get the most character, which is... Mm -hmm. We get a little like snippet early in the book where it's Vlad, I think, is kind of ribbing his sister because she apparently likes to dress up as a normal person and go by a very more standard name than Lacrimosa. Um, And I kind of thought that would be a thing that comes back. Like maybe her and Agnes kind of connect over it where Lacrimosa is kind of secretly jealous of Agnes because, you know, she gets to be so normal. But nope, never happens. I mean, that does get mentioned a little bit. But yeah, you're right. Nothing really comes of it. Yeah. I also wanted to call attention to this scene because for most of it, the POV character is the dwarf Casanunda, who appeared in several previous books. It's weird because he doesn't show up for the rest of the story. And him being here is so brief and flat that I wonder why we're not just focusing on the highwayman. Yeah, it kind of feels like, you know, a Stanley-esque cameo, where it's like half the joke is because he's there. I feel like maybe there was a previous draft or something that wanted him to be in the story more. Yeah. Uh, Just because also, like, uh, the thing with vampires being a metaphor for sex, him being a prodigious lover could probably play into it somehow. Yeah, and especially because of his relationship with Nanny and the kind of changes she takes on in the book. Like, it would have been a nice contrast, I think. There's not really any reason for it not to be him, but... It does seem kind of like a a weird choice. (laughs) At Lanker Castle, we meet the Royal Falconer, Hodgesarg, whose birds are acting strangely. They seem to be transfixed by some bright light that fell out of the sky, and he resolves to investigate it. This part and, you know, the the running appearances of the phoenix and Hodgesarg, Hodges Arg trying to hunt him down, feel like so disconnected until the very end a little bit yeah i think that's intentional yeah i was just i was very much like i i didn't really know what to do with them these moments when i was reading because yeah a phoenix to spoils a little bit of what that's going to be i guess there's an interesting contrast there that does get referenced in the text of the difference between a vampire being something that's dead and doesn't know it versus a phoenix being something that lives and lives again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they're not really, like, classically correlated. Yeah. The way that, say, vampires are with werewolves. Yeah, and I think maybe that was partially the intent to, to be like, well, yeah, everybody knows all these things about vampires, but aren't they all just, like, cliches? A uh, phrase that comes up throughout the whole story, sort of an awkward thing, is everybody knows that who knows anything about vampires. Mm-hmm. And part of the whole shtick is the characters are trying to subvert vampire tropes. Yeah, I feel like maybe if we just had, I don't know, I feel like maybe there's a chance, it was a chance to more, like, obviously tie it in maybe a little bit earlier on. I'm not sure. As Without, like, really being able to sit down and work out that idea, I'm not sure if that'd work better. It doesn't detract from the story at don't think but it is like mm-hmm. an odd decision that i think uh, the rationale was not fully clarified is that fair to say mm-hmm. it kind of almost feels like they were like two separate events that just both happen in this book so guests arrive for the naming ceremony but notable by her absence is the technically not the leader of the lanker witches granny weatherwax she's incensed because she didn't get an invitation to the naming unaware that it was stolen by birds. While everybody is at the naming ceremony, we get this, like, really intense little scene with uh, Granny inside her cottage, and she makes a comment about, like, she likes the tick of the clock because it's helpful on long nights. And I think it does a really, really good job of kind of putting you in her headspace. Lanker naming traditions require a religious official to lead the ceremony, But their usual holy man was in a donkey accident, so a replacement has been called up from a nearby mission, the quite reverend Mightily Oats. Oats is an Omnian, a follower of the god Om, whom we met in Small Gods. Originally a collective of fanatical zealots, they have since had so many schisms over minor differences in interpretation that they're largely... A, a whole collection of very different ble- peoples now. Oates is the culmination of this, caught between his faith and his 
desire to ask questions, giving him the same kind of split-mindedness that Agnes has. Yeah, I feel like getting to see Perdisha and Oates and how Agnes and Perdisha interact within themselves and how Oates interacts with himself as an anxious person it was like really refreshing to see that it, like you know this very internal like struggle we'll definitely circle back to that the naming ceremony begins and magrath presents her daughter who as a result of nanny og intimidating oats to the edge of a nervous breakdown is officially designated esmeralda margaret note spelling of lanker <laughs> best intentions <laughs> Really, can you be a like, member of the nobility without at least two middle names, right? <laughs> yeah, it just adds to the, like, gravita. You could do a lot worse. Note spelling, though, as a name for a character is kind of a great name. Yeah. Like, it's definitely silly, but it works. Maybe that'll be my next D&D character. <laughs> Note spelling, they're probably a tabaxi warlock or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once the princess has been officially named, the upper classes mingle. This is where Agnes meets a charming young gentleman named Vlad, who turns her on to the notion that there are vampires around. Agnes goes to get help from Nanny Og, and they try to slip garlic into as many appetizers as they can before Vlad reveals th that he and his family are the vampires. Surprising absolutely no one. Really? Someone named Vlad? I'm shocked. <laughs> I was very much imagining him as a very Brad Pitt-esque in Interview with the Vampire. And it's like, well, yeah, duh. It turns out that the Magpire family, or at least the Count, is determined to break free of the traditional vampire weaknesses through modern thinking. Positive attitudes, exposure therapy to holy symbols, and applying the Mithridates approach to garlic. That's uh, ingesting to build up an immunity, to clarify. Okay, I appreciate the explanation. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> I know that this kind of thing is the thing i've seen in media before where, you know like building uh like kind of prin uh, the princess bride where building tolerance to a poison by ingesting it little by little mm -hmm. it's funny to see that applied to like oh yeah holy symbols hey whatever works <laughs> nanny og confronts vlad and his family but she is pacified by vampiric hypnosis Agnes doesn't succumb to the same effect because her Perdisha voice is yelling at her, creating enough internal conflict to prevent the tranquility of mind control from taking hold. The same is true of Reverend Oates, and the two of them are the only people who really understand that the vampires are planning to stay and take over Lanker. Mm -hmm. Going back to what you said, it's interesting how being anxious and indecisive is a form of strength in this story, at least for here. The vampires use their mind control to assert of a sense of this is how the world works, not unlike elves in the previous story. And people who don't typically challenge their own thoughts are more susceptible to believing what the vampires want them to believe. I kind of interpret it as the, when you're, they describe it as being single-minded, you know, you're kind of just focused on what's in front of you. It's like your thoughts are more malleable into being shifted to what they want them to be. As Nanny and Agnes flee the castle and regroup to plan their next move, Hodgesgarg goes hunting for what he suspects to be a phoenix. And as we mentioned, he's absolutely correct. The Falconer's progress is somewhat hindered by the fact that none of the reference material seems to agree on what a phoenix looks like, but that doesn't stop him. It kind of feels like Hodges Arg is kind of shown to have this very, like, quiet and very specified intelligence. It goes back to the thing I was talking about last episode. There's no neurotypical characters in Discworld, and Hodges Arg, <laughs> like, definitely has a special interest in birds. And he seems very, like, detached and unaware to a lot of the other characters, but he knows what he knows about birds. Which you think would make him less likely to be attacked by them, but that is not <laughs> true. Knowing things and being good at them, I think, are slightly different. Mm. Well, actually, the book does mention that he's so good at training birds, that's why they start to attack him. Nanny Og returns to the castle to confront the vampires, only to get hypnotized again. Vlad attempts to seduce Agnes, 
delighted by her spirited resistance, and only temporarily dissuaded when she kicks him in the groin and leaves. Mm -hmm. During this scene, we also see that King Varence is struggling against the vampire's influence, but can't break free the way that Agnes and Oates can. Presumably, this is because Varence, who was a court jester before being made king, is no stranger to self-doubt and imposter syndrome, but at heart is a man of duty and conviction. It's especially clear in a short scene earlier, where Nanny Og mentions, I remember when you were just a man in a silly hat, and he replies, I still am. Yeah, I really appreciate Varence's, like, performance of kingship because it wasn't a book a while ago at this point where he slept at the door to his room because as a jester he always slept at the foot of his master and as a king now his master is his kingdom yeah it's like it feels very humbling and refreshing and i think this scene really kind of set the stakes like it became very very obvious just how much danger that all these characters were in because Agnes and Nanny Og can't do anything against the vampires at this point. Forced to retreat once again, Agnes and Nanny Og make their way to Granny Weatherwax's cottage, only to find it empty. Closer examination reveals that Granny left everything in sets of three, which Nanny realizes is referring to the coven. Now that Magrat has a child, Lanker is back to having a mother, a maiden, and a crone, and Granny feels that there's no more room for her. As someone with aforementioned anxiety, I'm no stranger to feeling left out in my own head. Yeah. Projecting my feelings onto other people. I very much get that. And I think we kind of, even though we don't get as close of a look into Granny's mindset at this point, I think through the struggles we see with Agnes and Perdicia and Oates, we do kind of see like what thought process that Granny's going through at this point. Together with Reverend Oates, the two witches resolve to go after Granny Weatherwax. But first, Agnes and Oates return to the castle to conscript Magrat into joining them. But she insists on bringing little Esme along for the ride. The baby doesn't have a whole lot of character in this story, but she's a baby. Yeah. I'm given to understand that until about, like, six months, they're basically just houseplants that scream. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think we can forgive a little lack of characterization (laughs) on this one. She is baby. The three witches leave Oates in the village and follow Granny's trail into the gnarly ground. Or gnarly round. One of those two. (laughs) There the landscape twists and warps to impede their path, exacerbated by Granny apparently using her power of borrowing to put herself into the landscape. Eventually, Nanny, Magret, and Agnes make it to the cave where Granny has taken up residence and apparently fail to persuade her to come back and face the vampires. Seemingly defeated, the witches return to Nanny Og's cottage, where they discuss the way forward. This is also where Nanny finds a small tattooed gnome, who she introduces to the others as one of the Knack McFeagle. <laughs> what did you think of these little guys? They were fantastic. And while I don't know if they like necessarily did a whole lot... I do appreciate the one who in every scene when they're running off just screams Knack Mac Fiegel. Just always. I know whenever I have to go into battle, <laughs> I always scream humans! Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> To summarize, for those who haven't read it, the Feagles are what you'd get if you crossed the Smurfs with Braveheart. They're a tribe of tiny men who love fighting and alcohol, and they speak a variant, in heavier quotes, variant, of Scots, just in case the stereotype wasn't obvious. While reading what the Knack MacFeagle were saying, I felt like I constantly should be understanding what they were saying and then being very confused when I can't, like, glean anything from it. I understand a little bit of Scots, but, like, this version of it also mixes in some Old English and Gaelic, just to further muddy the waters. It usually gets translated a little bit in story. Mm Mm-hmm. Nanny Og rallies a mob of villagers, mostly her own family, to storm the castle and drive out the vampires. The witches sneak in while the mob distracts the Count, and Agnes has another confrontation with Vlad. The Magpire family, along with several other vampires and a platoon of guards, prove to be more than a match for the Lanker mob. But then who should arrive but Reverend Oates, speaking prayers to exorcise the vamps. When the Count brushes him aside without breaking a sweat. (laughs) 
Then, when all hope seems lost, Granny Weatherwax arrives and gets bitten by a whole horde of vampires. While the Knack McFeagle discreetly kidnap King Varens for the witches, Agnes brings the drained Granny to Hogsgarg for safekeeping. This moment is kind of where Hajar shines, I guess, as a character in this book. Like, I think we just get a very like a good depiction of him and his relationships with others, but also like uh, his sense of like duty and his ability to care for things. Hmm. Elsewhere in the castle, Nanny and Magret are searching for a way out when they stumble into Igor, the Magpir's manservant who is none too happy about his employer's obsession with modernization. He was much happier serving the old count, uncle to the current head of the family. So much like how the V Minotaur from Greek legend has become a species in more recent fantasy like Dungeons and Dragons, Discworld has a whole extended tribe of Igors with a culture of surgical craftsmanship often working for mad scientists and others with passions that supersede ethics. Igor's a really interesting character. I think he provides a lot of, like, friction between him and, you know, our perception of what vampires should be and who the Magpiers actually are. Hmm. But it's really hard to read him talking, and I kind of just gave up at certain points because I, was, I, I have no idea how to decipher that word. I know that there was one I was sitting there and struggling and fighting with it for a few minutes. And then I think the word was like decisive. And I was like, I, I have no idea if that's correct, but I think that's what I'm going with. Igor gives Magrat, Nanny Og, and little Esme a lift in the Magpier's coach, taking them back to Uberwald. Meanwhile, Granny Weatherwax wakes up, frail and feeble, but not obviously vampired. Agnes helps her back on her feet. And Oates and Hodzarg look after her while Agnes goes to follow Nanny and Magrat. Out in the countryside, Agnes is intercepted by Vlad, who offers to make her a vampire, and explains how much better life would be if vampires were in charge of everybody. So there are two parts to this conversation that I want to discuss in more detail. The first is the personal temptation. Becoming a vampire sounds like it's everything Agnes could want, since it'll make her cool and mysterious and sexy. Ever since her introduction in Lords and Ladies, we've seen that Agnes is very insecure. And to borrow a phrase from Kurt Vonnegut, what mortal isn't? So being an immortal vampire would solve that. The question then becomes, why does she refuse? And it is partially a moral thing that she understands that vampires are evil. But from the narration, it seems like she's not primarily rejecting Vlad for his monstrosity, but because he's a creep and she doesn't like being manipulated. Yeah, it kind of feels like through the entire book, they kind of have this like push-pull thing going on. You know, in a slightly different story, I could very much see where like Agnes and Vlad end up together. I mean, we do get several versions of that story. Yeah. And part of me was found a little bit refreshing because, you know, Agnes is not the, like, traditional kind of romantic lead in this kind of story, you know? But at the same time, like, there are things that Vlad does and his family does that do make it kind of seem like if a relationship had happened, it would kind of feel like it's sweeping all that under the rug. Mm. The second part of their discussion is Vlad talking about life under modern vampiric rule. I'd like to highlight his reply when Agnes suggests that people could run away from Urwald. Really, on foot, with a family, and no money. Mostly they never even try. Most people put up with most things. I don't know about you, but to me that sounds like he's describing late-stage capitalism. Yeah, and unfortunately it seems like it's hitting that right on the head. But it's like, it's also very true. It's like, how are people supposed to leave a situation where they're unhappy if they don't have the resources and power to do so? Back in Lanker, the Knack McFeagles have brought King Varence to their hidey hole, where they pledge to help him retake the castle in exchange for him letting them live on an island out on the lake. Both of which are being mentioned for pretty much the first time, I think. <laughs> As for how they plan on helping him fight, well, that starts with him having something to drink. I do appreciate this uh, big Aggie character who is kind of like 
the queen of the knack knack fiegel though that seems like kind of a loose definition but i don't know it's just like in the movie in my head she just seems like a very like interesting character to look at and i like the like unspoken power she just howls over all the knack knack fiegel simply by existing mm-hmm. granny resolves to go confront the vampires taking with her the phoenix who has secretly followed Hodgsgarg back after he gave up on hunting it. It turns out that the phoenix can shapeshift, at least into other birds, which is why there are conflicting accounts of its appearance. Reverend Oates also decides to come along, definitely not because Granny is still weak from having her blood confiscated, no sir. Yeah, how dare anybody suggest such a thing. Yeah. I do appreciate that little, like, characterization note though on the phoenixes it feels like it really adds a bit of discworldness to them vlad decides to demonstrate for agnes how efficient life can be with modern vampires along the way they are joined by lacrimosa vlad's sister and several of their friends who tend to rebel against traditional vampire culture by wearing pastels and giving themselves names like gregory these are very like delightful things to imagine <laughs> and i really wish we got to see more of that in this book a little bit yeah everybody exoticizes the other right yeah mm-hmm. one of them even tells agnes that they really like her name yeah and she's like it's my actual name igor takes nanny og and magrat to the magpure family home don't go near the castle all one word <laughs> Great name. There, they learn more about the old count, who was a traditionalist and a sportsman, restricting himself to prey above the age of consent and always providing them with means of self-defense, including a whole wine cellar of water blessed by various religions. With this, and other things that he kept around, Nanny and Magret prepare to defend themselves and little Esme, who Nanny believes Granny Weatherwax is borrowing. Yeah, that's a thing that, like, they mention, like, kind of under their breath throughout the book a whole lot. That I think really sells the, like, internal struggle that Granny is having. Because in this book, and it's been mentioned a little bit in previous books, where she kind of feels this, like, pull to the darkness. Mm. And doesn't want to be a bad person. And so she really struggles with those feelings. And especially because of her fear of what happened to her sister happening to her. Her sister and I think her great-grandmother, who gets mentioned yeah. a couple times in here. As Granny and Reverend Oates make their way across the moors to Uberwald, they talk about faith, with Granny emphasizing the power of conviction. However, her injuries take their toll, and Oates ends up using his copy of the Book of Om as kindling for a campfire. Yeah, this seems like it was like a really pivotal moment for Oates, like where he ended up finding a bit of clarity about his own faith. And he makes a comment about how only the words that matter don't burn. Which I kind of, there was a scene like when Granny first wake up, wakes up, she f grabs this piece of burnt paper and it has some words on it. And as far as I can tell, they don't necessarily mean anything together. So I'm not sure if that was just like, not like a throwback, but... Maybe. But I think, I think she then throws it back into the fire to demonstrate that the words that truly matter aren't written on the page. Yeah, that's a possibility. That seems I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on at this point. <laughs> the vampires and Agnes land in the village of Escrow, which Count Magpire considers the crown jewel of his modern thinking. The arrangement is that, no more than twice a month, the vampires show up and drink from a random selection of the citizens plus a sip from the children who've just turned 12. Agnes is revolted by this, not just because it's monstrous to be drinking blood, but because the people of Escrow are being metaphorically turned into cattle. We've kind of seen it a little bit with what they've done to the citizens of Lanker and all the nobles, but this really sells like that the Magpiers are evil people, you know? They're not just bad guys who have different beliefs. It's like... They're doing a cruel thing to people. Yeah, and this isn't even, like, their hypnotism thing. They're trying to, to create the culture of this community to serve them. It's like they're very clearly, like, using their power to manipulate these people and to being subservient to them in the, like, greatest way possible. So I'm a little bit mixed on the execution here. Yes, the point is that the core of sin is treating people as things, like Granny says. 
but I'm trying to decide if that would be reinforced or cheapened if the story also leaned into body horror by, like, for example, the vampires installing spigots into the humans so they could tap them like a keg. I think that's one of those things where, you know, like, maybe it's a little, like, too on the nose. Yeah, probably. It's like, it, it's like it gets the message across. The vampires start the feeding process, but something seems to be holding them back. Almost immediately, the Count believes that Agnes has worked some witchcraft on them. She ends up punching Lacrimosa, which gives the people of Escrow the emotional boost they need to fight the vampires themselves. Vlad ends up biting Agnes, and she falls unconscious. Sometime later, Agnes wakes up to find the vampires have fled, and the villagers, who are unsure if she's a vampire, have decided to form a mob and storm the castle. The vamps themselves have already returned there, only to find Igor throwing bottles of holy water at them like Molotov cocktails. <laughs> Frustrated beyond reason, the Count decides that they should just follow their instincts, which would be easier if they weren't also struggling with a weird craving for tea. There's also a bit in here where the Count's efforts to train his children into not being affected by holy symbols backfires, making it so they can see the abstract shape of one holy symbol or another, basically no matter where they look. It's a great moment, but it doesn't really go anywhere. Yeah, I think it shows the consequences of like when you do exposure therapy but wrong. It's like you don't end up fixing the problem, you just make it a slightly different problem. <laughs> The Count wants to be a good dad, but he just ends up traumatizing his children. <laughs> Granny and Oates arrive at the castle, and the phoenix rises in full glorious flame. While it starts striking down vampire lackeys, Granny and Oates reconvene with Nanny and Agnes to confront the magpires. Meanwhile, Igor creeps down to the crypt, where he spills a drop of blood on an innocuous pile of dust. This uh, little bit with Igor kind of like tightens the thing up that I had been a little confused about earlier in the book. Because they mention that vampires die, but they'll eventually come back. You know, it's just kind of a cyclical thing. And so when they were mentioning that, oh, he served the old Count Magpire, I was suddenly very confused on where that one went. And this actually like gave me an answer on that. Magrat manages to defeat the Countess by getting her to turn into mist and trapping the mist in a jar. But the Count and his children eventually take her and little Esme as hostages. Granny tortures the vampires by casually flaunting a cup of tea at them, but apparently forgetting to drink it. She reveals that she didn't borrow herself into the baby like Nanny Og had suspected, nor into the Reverend Oates like Agnes had theorized. No, she put herself into her own blood so that when they drank it, they gained the essence of Granny Weatherwax. Yeah, it's like one of those things that really shows you just how clever Granny is. And it's a great, great, great moment. <laughs> but I also really think it shows like how her and Nanny and Agnes all have their very different strengths, you know? Nobody knows Granny Weatherwax as well as Granny Weatherwax, so none of them would be able to predict what she could possibly do. Yeah. And Granny's greatest strength is being the one who solves the plot. <laughs> That's definitely kind of the case with her. Though, it kind of feels like Magrat always kind of got the short end of the stick as far as, like, being shown as, like, clever and competent. But the little thing with the jar is just, like, a really nice moment that really shows, you know, she's just as clever, just maybe we don't get to see it as often. Her thing has always been inexperience, right? The only thing separating her from being as good a plot solver as Granny Weatherwax is, is time. Yeah, and this is really the moment that sticks out to me when I was thinking about, like, you know, it feels like it shows that she's matured as a witch. Totally. She doesn't even consider magical solutions to it. She's just like, oh, hey, a jar will work. Thunk. Yeah, and especially because, like, everybody it was freaking out being like, well, what are the, what are they going to do about this mist coming through a door, you know? Even the strongest door can't do anything about that. And then Magrat just buttons that up really nice and neat. Good on her. Yeah. <laughs> Powerless to do anything that Granny wouldn't do, the vampires are further surprised when the old Count returns. And doubly so when the mob of villagers make it clear that they preferred his way of doing things. Shaken and angry, 
the current count tries to escape, but finds his way blocked by mightily oats wielding an axe. The vampire mocks the reverend, noting that an axe isn't a holy symbol. To which Oates replies, Let's make it one! And cuts off the Count's head. Total, like, hero move on that. But I also think it's a really good show, like, show of the growth that Oates goes through in the book. And how having religion is not the same thing as having faith. Yeah, I was just gonna make a joke about One decapitated <laughs> vampire! Ah, ah, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Been saving that one all episode. <laughs> With the head of the family removed, the old Count steps back into his former role, adopting Vlad and Lacrimosa to teach them the merits of stupid tradition. With that, the witches and oats return to Lanker, where the castle has been reclaimed by King Varence fighting off the remaining vamps in a drunken fury. Reverend Oats decides to spread the word of Om in Überwald, with Agnes giving him an awkward blushing goodbye. And, of course, Granny Weatherwax returns to her cottage. So, that was Carpe Junculum. What did you think? I think it was, like, a very, very excellent book. All the Discworld books are very fun, and I've enjoyed reading all of them. This one feels like, you know, it's still very funny, but there's also, there's also this great sense of, like, real stakes of what happens if they fail. <laughs> I completely agree. It also feels like a perfect book to read at, like, Halloween or something. Absolutely, yeah. Actually, this book was published in November, so it came out a little late. Just missed it. Some points. At the start of the show, I mentioned how this how this book makes accidental references to stories that were written after it, with Vlad falling for Agnes because he can't read her mind. Obviously, I was referring to the classic work of vampire fiction, True Blood, and Twilight, obviously. Yeah, you gotta squeeze that one in there. I'm not about to say that Pratchett invented this idea of a vampire falls in love with somebody who can resist them, because it's a natural extension of the idea that the powerful are interested in that which they can't control, a common element of romance. I am a little disappointed that that this didn't get a little bit more explored. Agnes is supposed to be a main character, but she doesn't get to see the subplot through completely, because her chances at confronting Vlad are... A little bit undercut by the influences of Granny's blood and the old count taking him away at the end. Mm -hmm. She does get a good moment where she's just like, I would not save you from the mob and everything. It's like, it's non-zero. It is lacking. Yeah. Which kind of robs her of a little bit of personal growth. Like I said, being a vampire is what old Agnes would have wanted. And fully rejecting it means embracing who she is. And it feels like that character growth is instead given to Oates. And she just develops a crush on him as kind of a rebound to Vlad. Yeah, totally. And, you know, especially because, like, so much of vampire fiction does talk about, on um, you know, that relationship between the victim and the vampire. And how Agnes kind of is supposed to kind of play the victim in this. And how Vlad is, like, very clearly interested in her why they're like that conflict wasn't sold you know because it's set up all the way through the book yeah but then kind of withers off and it's a shame because that was really interesting but obviously there's not always room for everything and like it's not like she got no growth she did get i think at least a little bit of that yeah she does get a sense of like she has a better idea of who she is she feels a little bit more confident you know i don't know i think especially because you know she would not be your traditional like female lead in this kind of thing because she's very opinionated and you know she's a very heavy set girl yeah like the idea that she rejects the romance even though like you know Vlad is supposed to be irresistible Vlad is supposed to be irresistible because you know even she can see that he's a bad person and she doesn't need that yeah returning to a point about anxiety the story demonstrates a power in being able to doubt, which is especially relevant in the context of vampires as a metaphor for aristocratic parasitism. Like, those in power thrive when nobody questions their claim to that power, and left unchecked, they seek to extract as much value as they can from those under their influence. It's a little weird how Oates kind of then grows to be, like, sure and confident when that's kind of what made made people vulnerable to them. I think Oates is a very interesting character, but it feels like his plotline is a little, like, confused on what it's supposed to be in this book. 
But I do really, really like how he and Agnes are portrayed on, you know, their doubt. Because, you know, as an anxious person, I do know that sometimes, like, my anxiety has saved me a lot of heartache or trouble because I spent so much time thinking about a thing that I was able to see the errors in something before I got to the point where I needed to make the decision, you know? So despite the fact that it can be really detrimental and a thing that you have to really work around, there are moments where it is helpful. I also wanted to draw a comparison between the Magpier's exploitation of humans in escrow and a specific episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, namely Season 3, Episode 9, The Wish, which aired one month after this book was published. Both show vampires openly exerting their influence over a community and warping it to match their desires. The main difference is that that the Magpiers are aiming at a banality of evil shtick with trying to pressure the humans into just acceptance. While the vampires in that episode of Buffy are more about embracing uh, mechanization to gruesome effect. So both are interesting ways of asking how vampires would modernize. And I'd be curious how they are affected by their respective mediums and the cultures that inspired their creators. I didn't make it that far into Buffy, so I haven't actually seen this episode. But you could definitely, like, really, really break it down, the comparison between these two kinds of things and, like, both their portrayal of vampires and also, like, what they're trying to say about, you know, what their allegory is for. I wanted to bring it up mostly because one of my roommates is a super <laughs> huge Buffy fan. We watched the whole series uh, last year, which mm-hmm. I think was her, like, fourth or fifth time rewatching it <laughs> look there's some things you just gotta like give a good through like once over like really get it out of your system at that point yeah that comparison was just interesting to me but yeah 1998 apparently a good year for vampire fiction because like buffy's in full swing oh, yeah. this book comes out and also blade Ooh, that's definitely like a trifecta <laughs> yeah vampires are one of those things that humans do not get tired of making up stories about oh yeah No, I feel like vampires are always interesting, even when they get, like, silly and weird. Especially when they get silly and weird. We've got Mm -hmm. what we do in the shadows to prove Mm -hmm. that. Oh, I love what we do in the shadows. Yeah. Two-time winner of the Lord Ruthless Award. Ooh. (laughs) That seems appropriate. Yeah. I did this report on zombies, I think, when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, And how they, like, were presented in fiction. And... I read this thing, and I'm totally blanking on what it was, because this was, like, ten years ago. Yeah. Um, But, basically, the author's point was that, you know, we get a lot of vampire fiction, we get a lot of vampire fiction when people feel very comfortable and confident about the, like, time period that they're living in. We get a lot of zombie fiction when people are feeling really insecure about, you know, how the world is going. Hmm. And so, through the 90s and early 2000s, we got a lot of vampire fiction, because, you know, we were kind of, we were writing like an economic boom. And so people felt really comfortable and confident with how like things could be going. I can kind of see that. Although also like Twilight came out in 2005 and I don't recall mm-hmm. that being a super like comfortable time. Yeah, I think that's probably like a thing that has a bit of, you know, lag on it. I can see that. Yeah. Which especially makes sense because it takes, like, you know, from the start of signing a contract to getting a book published, you know, that usually is a thing that takes about a year for most people. Yeah. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, uh, Liz, Mm -hmm. for now, this is the end of the Witches series. Wow, really? Yeah. Aw, I like the Witches books. I know, me too. (laughs) Did they come back, like, at any point? Uh, Little bits in different ways, but yeah. Aw, okay. Yeah. I'll take what I can get, I guess. I also wanted to share, since this is our two-year anniversary, it might be fun to share some reviews from the podcast. So these are on Apple Podcasts. Let me just load it real quick. So far, all the reviews have been five stars. So thank you very much, everybody who took that time. Mm -hmm. Here's one review from Nash Yaga. Lovely podcast. Brings a lot of insights and analyzes the text in ways I never considered before. And from Burble Fleff, great. An enjoyable romp through and through. Every episode feels as long as it needs to be. And I find this to be a great way to experience the books without reading them. Good. I think that's what we're shooting for. Yeah. I think on both counts. And if you wanted to leave a review or a rating on iTunes, that's always appreciated. Of course, I can't be bothered to rate or review most of the podcasts I listen to, so I won't judge you if you, that's not your bag. <laughs> That's fair. If you want to get in touch with us, maybe let us know stuff that we missed in our discussion, you'd always head over to our Discord, where we chat directly with fans. 
since we're almost at the end, thank you as always for joining me, Liz. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. I also want to thank Willow Carter for our theme music and all of our listeners for following along. If you're listening and don't know about our social media, we're on Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook. Plus, I share each episode on YouTube and Reddit. If you're a supporter on our Patreon, we randomly choose from among y'all one person to thank in each episode. And this month it goes to Robin, who continues to be our small god. (laughs) Thanks, Robin. And of course, we like to end each episode by sharing the favorite footnote as voted by you. It was obvious to King Varence that even if every adult were put under arms, the Kingdom of Lanker would still have a very small army. And he'd therefore look for other ways to put it on the military map. Sean had come up with the idea of the Lancastrian Army Knife, containing a few essential tools and utensils for the soldier in the field. And research and development work had been going on for some months now. One reason for the slow progress is that the king himself was taking an active interest in the country's only defense project. And Sean was receiving little notes up to three times every day with further suggestions for improvement. Generally, they were on the lines of a device, possibly quite small, for finding things that are lost. Or a curiously shaped hook-like thing of many uses. Sean diplomatically added some of them, but lost as many notes as he dared, lest he design the only pocket knife on wheels. So next month we'll be sinking our fangs into 1999's The Fifth Elephant. Until then, the turtle Turtle moves. moves.